Knowing when to sell a fund is crucial for maintaining good returns within your portfolio. In this video, we're going to look at how to review your holdings and we're going to give lots of examples of when you might want to consider selling. If you only look to sell funds when the markets are down, the danger is that you end up selling high volatility or high beta funds. And what happens with these funds is that they rebound quickly and make new highs and then you regret your decision to sell. So instead of doing that, you need to undertake a detailed review on a regular basis, maybe every three, six or 12 months, and then look at the performance benchmark against comparatives and that will give you a much more disciplined way of looking at your portfolio. But first up, we'll look at potentially selling and underperformer. And here we've got Linsel Train Global Equity. Now I call them Linsel Train Rec because they are so bad. And with the criteria column, we've got the NTR, I think it's like net total returns. Five years, it's 185th out of 190 one year 245th out of 276 so the returns are pretty awful let's look at the portfolio well first of all it's a bit of an old man's portfolio for someone who drives a volvo smokes a pipe wears slippers there's none of the magnificent seven in there it's as though the internet hasn't really happened also, you can see that Mr. Trainwreck is taking some really big bets with something like 8% of the portfolio in London Stock Exchange Group. And that company is quite mature. There's not many new flotations on the London Stock Exchange. It's difficult to see how the share price of that company is going to outperform. We've got fees of 0.6%. We've got a very high allocation to the UK, even higher than something like a Vanguard life strategy. We've got a low allocation to healthcare and things like information technology. So I think on the balance of all that and the performance, I would look to sell this fund. So next up, let's look at Scottish Mortgage from the fund manager, Faley Gifford. Now the issue here is that although the NASDAQ has been making new highs, it's going to take a long time for Scottish Mortgage to make new all-time highs. So Scottish Mortgage is very much something that you need to consider for the long term, maybe like seven years or more. And if you have that level of trust in the fund manager, and if you have that level of patience, then maybe it is a good fund for you. Also with investment trusts, you can play the price to net asset value game where you can buy the fund when it's on quite a discount to the net asset value and then sell as that discount closes. My concern here is that if you're going for technology and the next big thing, maybe you're better off going for the NASDAQ 100 because then you've always got the winners. You've got the largest market capitalization. You've got the survival of the fittest. If you go for an active fund manager in this space, you kind of have double volatility because you've got the volatility of the underlying nature of technology and then the volatility of what the fund manager decides to do. My other concern is around the private equity holdings of the fund, which are around about 27%. And in the last three years, I'm not aware of any of them floating on any stock market. I'm not aware of any exits at a profit. So that part of the portfolio is quite opaque and it's kind of quite long term. I talk about two types of holdings in your portfolio, one that is core and the other that is satellite. And Scottish Mortgage is very much a satellite holding. It's got a strong active share that means it's quite different to the underlying index that it's looking to track which can be a good thing it can be a source of outperformance so the idea with core holdings is that you never really sell them unless you're in retirement and you're using money to fund your expenditure so typical core holdings would be some kind of global tracker or something that's quite similar to that, like a quality factor exchange traded fund. So it's the satellite holdings that need to get a firm 
solid review to check that they still meet the criteria that you hold in order to keep them in your portfolio. So if you don't sell any of these satellite holdings, you just end up collecting them like stamps or teaspoons or something, and you end up with an unwieldy portfolio. It's got all sorts of junk in it, difficult to know what the purpose of the portfolio is, very difficult to manage. You're going to have a lot of issues when you try to decumulate and actually spend the portfolio, and it's just a real mess. Sometimes within your satellite portfolio, the price of one of the holdings will absolutely shoot up and go nearly vertical. And in those instances, the price growth is not sustainable and you have to be prepared to exit. So this is the chart of a clean energy ETF, which was a bubble set to burst. And as you can see, it's going to take a long time for this thematic ETF to make a new all time high. As you get older, the aim should be to have fewer holdings, but each of those holdings you'll know well. You'll know how they perform across different market conditions and you'll have much more confidence in them. You'll feel a lot less of a need to chase the top performers. Should I sell Fundsmith? Well, here's its performance over five years against a global tracker. The global tracker has fees of maybe 0.2% compared to 1% for Fundsmith. People who've held Fundsmith for 10 years still like it. They still want to stick with Terry Smith. But those who've held it in more recent periods, say like over about three years, clearly aren't very happy. So if you've got a new holding in your portfolio, you should possibly leave it for about a year until you start to review its performance so that funds don't come in and out of your portfolio too frequently. And also this discipline will mean that if you buy something like a semiconductor thematic ETF, if you know that you've got to hold it for at least a year, you'd probably do more research before buying it and you'd be less interested in just buying it on a whim. Sometimes you have to sell because you got your analysis wrong. So with Vietnam, I was told things like it's going to move from a frontier market to an emerging market. But I don't think that's going to happen now in the near future. I was told that people are moving production from China to Vietnam because of China's record on things like human rights, when actually China invests very heavily in Vietnam. And if China has a recession, then Vietnam gets dragged down quite heavily with it. I was told that the companies here are great value. They're on low P.E. ratios. But if you actually correctly compare the P.E. ratios to comparable companies in other emerging markets, then they're pretty much fair value. So there's no real guarantee that this will outperform and maybe it's just a bit too narrow in its focus, just having one country. And you might be better off with a broader frontier markets fund that can benefit from all sorts of changes across a wide variety of geographies. Another reason to sell is when you realize that the fund you've got is just a total yield trap and you're a bit too hypnotized by a high dividend yield and you didn't quite do the depth of research into other things to understand what's really going on. A classic thing that has tripped up a lot of investors is the high level of gearing behind some of these high yield, maybe like investment trusts. And so they're going to have to refinance all these borrowings, maybe not now, but in a few years time. And that's going to be a real drag on the price of the investment trust. And also it might lead to a dividend cut further down the line. And then what are you going to do when that happens? And maybe it's best to just cut and run on some of these more esoteric high yielding funds. So what should you do if the fund manager leaves? So I've highlighted Royal London Global Equity Select and We've done very well out of it, but now the pretty much the whole team that used to run the fund have left. So we've got to try and work out whether the fund managers were responsible for the outperformance or whether it's more the 
ethos of Royal London that helped to carry the fund and whether there's a strong objective and discipline behind how the fund works. The problem here is that the fund is actually pretty opaque and it's quite difficult to see what they were doing to really get this outperformance. So on balance, I feel that the fund manager was very good and that they did assist with the outperformance of the fund. And that would make me likely to sell the fund in the short to medium term because I'm not that confident that the new team in charge are going to be able to replicate the performance. Now, they're unlikely to change the portfolio much in the first few months of them running the fund, but I feel the fund will get quite an exodus of money from it. And because it does have some small cap holdings within it, I think those holdings will come under pressure. They'll have to be sold down a little bit and the price of those holdings might fall. So even in the shorter term, there might be some risk around the fund. Also, I think as I get older, I feel that a global tracker, I mean, it's reasonable returns. And so sometimes you just don't need to take the risk. You don't need to spend the extra money on the fees unless you've got some really solid reasons as to why the outperformance occurs. The fortunate thing here is that I've got the methodology to select the best performing funds. So I'm not that worried about exiting one at a profit because I feel I can always find something to replace it that will be maybe equally as good or at least comparable. If you want to learn more, check out my website, ianshandrack.com slash portfolio dash coaching.